Pig. Peppa. Babe. Inosuke. The Shadow Hog. Wilbur. Bebop. Moblins. Little Three the. Uh, wait. Let's talk about boar folk. Yeah, that's not totally right. I'm going to talk about boar folk. But moreover, I'm going to talk more about where boar, or basically just creating your own races from creatures from scratch. That sentence tracks. I touched on this process a little bit on the why you should play polar bears video, but I really wanted to transition from using a straight stat block and monster levels into creating something out of the stat block and creating a race that is wholly unique from those monstrous entries. In. Don't get me wrong, there are quite a few homebrews out there on the internet already for boar folk, so if you want to use one of those, go right ahead. But for me, I'm going to start with the Pathfinder boar stat block and walk you through why and how I choose to build them the way that I do. Step one, stats. No, wait. Step one half, point five. Just alpha this one real quick. Pre one step. What the fuck am I doing? That, that wasn't existential panic. Totally get why you might think it was. Really, when you're sitting down to make a character, you need to ask yourself, what is your intent? Because if you're just trying to make the most OP character possible, just roll a human that's half vampire, half lich, and I don't know, dated a fire giant at some point. Seriously, there are easier ways to break the game than going through the process of creating your own custom race on D&D Beyond. Why are there so many buttons? That's all I want to know. It shouldn't take me an hour to make an otter druid. Just let me choose otter. It's like it's already in the stats somewhere. Just pfft, character, done. Togwash. Step, um, where are we again? This little piggy went to market. This little piggy. Wait, two thirds? No. What, we're at like nine sixteenths or something? We're not there. We're not quite to one yet. Just figure out what you're actually doing. If you want to be a humanoid pig, just roll a variant human and say, you look like a pig. That's it. End of video. Roll credits. But if that's not what you want, let's move on to step one. Is everyone still here? I just assumed everyone was going to pick human. <laughs> step one. Step one. You've obviously decided, to no chagrin of my own, that uh, you would not go the human route, and so we might as well just lean into the pig. Sentence totally tracks. All right, either way, whether you're designing a humanoid animal or an anthropomorphic animal, you have to decide how much folk you're putting into the creature and how much pig is going to go into this pig folk. So, yeah, boars and pigs, they're different, I don't care. In the immortal words of Gaz, the taster of pork, everything tastes like pig. And that's fine. I tend to lean into the boar side of things. The more creature you put into your character, the more unique they feel. So looking at the stats for a common boar, you see that they're a lot like most other creatures. High constitution, high strength, low in charisma. They're not going to win any beauty contests or start their own cult anytime soon. But that doesn't mean that you can't if you play as one of these boar folk. Because you're rolling your own stats, you could just use Tasha's guide to whatever and make everything just one for one straight out of the book you, you don't have to create something totally new when i think of boar folk i think of thick hides and endurance and they should probably have that plus two to constitution and a plus one to strength uh, but thanks to tasha you could reasonably decide to swap that out and see what fits for your character but once again make sure you're doing it for flavor and not for power gaming seriously just because you want to play a boar folk wizard doesn't mean they should have a plus two to intelligence that doesn't always make sense look at things like the now feshni nefeshni Little Feshni, I think that's right. They exist. They kind of follow the same rules, albeit they winged pig demon powers. Just be cool. Believe me, boars should have a constitution higher than pretty much anything else. I think that makes the most sense for what they are in every other instance of a boar in the game. That being said, that's not always a hard and fast rule because most monsters or creatures, especially larger creatures, are going to have a bonus to their constitution just because they are higher level and they're huge and they're big. So depending on what you're creating and the monster you're looking at, really look at the stats and decide which one should be the highest based on if that creature was level one. Like what's their inherent nature? It should just pop into your head when you look at the creature. Step two, which is where people tend to get caught up and it's deciding the traits and abilities. And a lot of people get hooked up on this because they see things like the Drow or some of the other advanced races in Pathfinder and they think, well, I have to have a bunch of traits and a bunch of abilities, when really, sometimes you only need one or two to really make them interesting. Looking at some of the higher level monsters, you see things like resistances, monster feats, flight, swim speed, vision types, proficiencies. And if you're worried about getting too complicated with this, this might be another good point to stop and say, maybe we just use the variant human and read through chapter one of Tasha's Cauldron. Uh, and that should really be enough. If you want to start a race on D&D Beyond, I would still recommend reading chapter one first, or at the very least, check out Pathfinder's Advanced Race Guide. They have a great section for creating new races, and that can help a lot with uh, creating something totally new and maintaining balance. If you do start building something or taking something from the book and it doesn't quite seem to fit right, 
the thing that a lot of people forget is that animals, monsters, NPCs, anything in one of these books already has levels. Whether they're monster levels, levels of polar bear, or levels in fortune teller. And that is a thing, you can look that up. Most races going from the monster manual to a playable race won't maintain these monster levels and feats. That's your job, playing the character. Most of these traits are pretty much just good to copy over. So when you're looking at the boar folk for conversion, uh, we have to look at a few different things. First off, pathfinders and boar have natural armor, ferocity, and uh, toughness feat. Those are all pretty great. But when you look at the natural armor and ferocity, they're probably coming straight from the natural levels in boar, or from the monster feats that they're obtaining as they level up. Toughness, being a, just a general feat, seems more reasonable something that like a variant human would have or would be able to get access to. We have some crossover when looking at different types of boars and pigs throughout the thing, so I think that would be a great staple for this race moving forward. <clears throat> On the D&D side of things, we also see natural armor, which isn't uncommon for monster races, as well as the ability relentlessness, allowing them to revive after being taken down to zero hit points, which we've already seen in half-orcs and orcs, so maybe The Legend of Zelda had it right and orcs are kind of pig people. Which which came first, the bacon or the egg? So if you're creating the boar folk for D&D specifically, we can take a quick look and see that all forms of boars at different levels have this ability. So that would make sense for the boar folk to have it as well. In both Pathfinder and D&D, we also see that they have a charge attack as well as access to a natural attack of a gore or a tusk natural attack because of their tusks. Do you tusk people with tusks or do you root people with tusks? Either way, that doesn't sound right, so we're just going to gloss over it. I would lean into the pig and boar's ability to stuff out truffles, uh, and by that I mean giving them proficiency in smelling-based perception checks, but that is really about it. I don't think any other base rhyme or reason should give them proficiencies or languages based around the fact that they may or may not have a delicious porcine flavor that is to say bacon-based seasonings. Y you really don't have to do a lot of trait design for them. The rest of their build should really be based on your background and your class choices. The only other thing we have to worry about is what dice to use for their charge attack and their natural attack. Most of that can be decided by the size of the character or just pulling it verbatim out of the stat block. That's fine. Some of which will be based on their hit dice, which you can just calculate based on their current level. Uh, the charge attack for a boar in D&D &D is a medium-sized creature dealing 1d6 damage with a DC 11 strength check. Uh, and that's pretty simple. I think the damage could easily scale up with strength, and I don't see why the DC shouldn't go up. A good example of this is the Minotaur being a large-sized creature as well as being higher level, having a 2d8 points for its core attack instead of a 1d6. Many times there are examples of this 8 plus your proficiency bonus plus strength or something to that variation. For the dice, if it's a small boar folk, maybe it should drop down to a d4, or if it's a large, it can move up to a d8 or a d10. It really depends on how you want to use it, and it should be something that you talk to your DM about. This can get way more complicated if your race is emulating something that has like multiple attacks or breath weapons or spell-like abilities. If you want to do something that silly, you might just want to take a few levels of the monster to have it, and that way you don't have to worry about it. Otherwise, you have to look at the hit dice of the creature, not the challenge rating, you can ask your DM about taking monster feats or gaining access to some of those extra moves that don't seem to fit normal play. You could give up a feat uh, to make your racial abilities enhanced as you level up. That's a pretty legit way to do it. Look at the Drown Nobility feat tree from Pathfinder. It's beautiful. It, it works out really well and it becomes really powerful, but you have to spend a lot of time investing into those innate abilities of the Drow race. Like Detect Magic at Will. It's bananas. It's so good, though. And really, that's it. I mean, that's the that's the starting point. That's what you should achieve to do when making a new race. You see something in the book, you like it, find out what distills it, makes it unique, and then break it down into something that is playable. Don't try to go for the OP stuff or get every single possibility, every box filled and checked. Um, sometimes simple is best. Your characters really can shine without having to be overly complicated. Thanks again for watching. We're doing daily live streams over on Twitch as well as playing D&D games on a regular basis over here on the Discord. If you have a really cool race that you've created, Created or maybe just a fun character that you like to play, we'd love to hear about it. Uh, commissions are open once again as of June, and we're creating new tokens and D&D assets all the times that are available to the Patreon members. Remember to keep your dice on the table, and just because Grandma has big eyes doesn't mean you should cut her open and see what she had for dinner. Besides, there might be leftovers. Sweet, sweet pulled pork. Wait, I guess this is under the assumption that the three little pigs and Red Riding Hood were both eaten by the same wolf and house. Do all fairy tales take place in the same house? What are Hansel and Gretel even doing here? Rugby, get the bear traps. No, it's too late. It's a ambush.